The Talk of Muskegon, News Talk 1090, WKBZ. Welcome to the Renegade River Show. My name is Mike Hewitt, and my guest today is Matt Wiedenhoft. Matt, welcome to the Renegade River Show. I should say welcome back to the Renegade River Show. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me again, Mike. Appreciate it. Listen, I know you've got a big announcement to do, but before we get there, I've got something vastly more important than whatever you could possibly say to mention. Today, before I came to the radio station, I went to my grandson Chase's birthday at Kangaroo Palace. So a little bit of bouncing. I'm a little bit tuckered out. But listen, I don't think there's anything better than a grandbaby birthday party. That's just me. And speaking of grandbabies, one of the things that <clears throat> Renegade River Show gets out of iHeartRadio is I've got my family that listens in Las Vegas. I've got a bunch of friends in California that listen. Imagine that. And then I've got a bunch of folks that I worked with uh, once upon a time up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And on a birthday note, one of their names is Brian Farrell. And he asked me on Facebook to do a, sh- a shout-out. And I'm not big for shout-outs, but listen, Brian Farrell's a very nice guy. Happy birthday, Brian. Now, Matt, let's get down to some, some brass tax politics. You've got an announcement today. Tell me what we're doing. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. I got a big announcement for today. I am announcing my candidacy for the 89th District, Michigan State House of Representatives. Um, I'm, you got to help me a little bit here. When you and I last talked, you were, I, I think, on the verge of becoming a, a Senate, a Senate, a U.S. Senate candidate. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And what, what's the big change? Well, I really wanted to make a statement with that race, but after looking closer at Lansing and studying more about what's going on there, I just felt that it became clear I had to do something more that was impactful. Um, I'm a little bit taken back. I, I, I think good for you. Tell me, though, give me some examples. What, what about Lansing that's so off the tracks that causes you to say, I need to, I need to do more than make a political statement. I need to get involved. What's, what's that about? Well, here, here's the deal, Mike. <clears throat> I'm a fiscally conservative businessman. An educator committed to fostering the parent-teacher relationship and the choices over the government mandates. I believe in personal responsibility of health care over the choices that the government provides. And on top of that, vibrant job growth within our community and the state itself is needed more now than ever before. Um, that's that's a, a pretty healthy list of reasons, but you, when you look at those reasons, what you're telling me is that you don't think that Michigan, uh, or at least at least Amanda Price, who's the incumbent in the 89th district, you don't either think either her or the state in general are not on the right track. Is that a fair statement? Very fair. Okay. Um, what what makes you think that your background, your experiences, how are you qualified to, to make that change? Well, I believe I'm uniquely qualified. I am the founder and lead consultant of Polano Consulting, which we do sports and small business consulting. I am an educator at the higher ed level at Davenport University and Baker College here in Muskegon uh, in the business departments where I teach management, business, accounting, and economics. And I'm husband with three kids. It's made me more driven than ever before to get into this and make that difference happen. So for you, it's about your family. 100%. That's, that's what I'm getting out of what you just said. Tell me a little bit about the education part. You, you perked my ears up a little bit. Um, what, what do you teach at, at Davenport and Baker? What, what's that about? Well, at Davenport, I teach an uh, intro-level management class, uh, get the foundations base set for the uh, students moving forward in their programs. I do a co-op with uh, high school students in the business class, which is an intro to business class, and we teach them what it is to start a business and show them there is more outside of high school. And then at Baker, I teach microeconomics and intermediate accounting, which is a higher level accounting class. It's four accounting majors. So it's a pretty in-depth class that I teach over there with the micro and the uh, intermediate. Okay, that's some pretty heavy lifting. Um. Tell me when when I, whenever I hear of a primary challenger, I, I guess I have a my tendency is to think in at least in the Republican primary, my tendency is to think that, okay this person must be far right, you're, you know right of the Tea Party kind of right. So when when you 
How do you identify yourself if I said you're a liberal, you're a moderate, you're a conservative? Where are you at on the spectrum? Well, the reality is I'm just from the common sense faction. Uh, my candidacy isn't about the same old party politics, same old party rhetoric. I want to go and solve problems that actually help the people within our state. That's where I'm coming from. It's not about right, left, moderate. It's about what makes sense for us. Can you give me some examples? I'm, I'm trying to get my head around what, what you're saying to me. Well, as an educator, it's extremely important that we foster a greater community involvement rather than more government and even more importantly, really, which is the most important part, a greater relationship between the parents and teachers. That's the greatest foundation we can have. In fact, I think parents and teachers and local schools should be making more educational decisions rather than the state as a, as a top level. Okay, let me, let me stop you for a minute, just because while you're talking, I'm thinking of the things that have, Amanda Price is working on. These are things that, that I th- and I know her, I've, I've certainly met her a number of times. I, I, I don't have a personal relationship, but I, but I have a, a, when we talk, we have a, a friendly relationship, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know from those conversations that she's taken up education as one of the things that I think that she thinks that she shines in. And an example of that is that she's floating a bill right now that would suggest that the, uh, the, the, that, that's a man, to use your word, some mandates would be established that a third grader, for example, if a third grader is not reading to a certain level, then that third grader well, shall be held back. Um, wh- what is your thought about that kind of, you're an educator, so what is that? Well, I, I would uh, completely disagree uh, with a third grade reading level mandate. Um, not every child develops at the same rate. I was talking to my son last night about this, actually, on the way back from the Michigan State U of M hockey game, and he didn't understand what I was talking about. And I said, Landon, if you didn't read at the state level that they chose for you to read at, your mother and I and your teacher have no discussion in that. You stay back. And he said, well, that doesn't make sense. And he's nine years old, and he's telling me this. And I said, well, what doesn't make sense? He goes, well, why does the state who doesn't know me make the decision? Doesn't mean I can't read. Maybe I just don't test well. I said, Lana, it wouldn't matter. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing, bud. This is why you, you want me to do what I'm doing. And he's like, yeah, Daddy, it, this doesn't make sense. And he's nine. When you said earlier, you talked about, um, I can't remember the exact words, but fostering greater community involvement, I think. When, when you say that, are you at least as it relates to education, are you talking about trying to get the community more involved in things like school boards? Yeah. Is that what you have in mind? I, and I ask that because, in, 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 in fact, I've complained on this show before that a lot of folks that have a, a lot of things to complain about, but when you go to the various meetings that are appropriate for those complaints, they're virtually empty. I, I mean, you know, people will yell about township taxes. You get to the township, and there, there's nobody there but the township board. You get to the – and everyone's yelling about the school board by the, or the schools in general. By the way, from both sides of the ideological spectrum, there are complaints about – Opposite complaints, perhaps, but and then you get to the school board meeting. And there's the same three or four people there to yell about the fact that Johnny or Sally was punished inappropriately for some the fact that they're angelic, etc. So you're telling me that what you're wanting to do is reach into the community and try to build that bridge. Am I got my head around that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We need to get people involved at, at the community level. Okay. Now on a state level, you're telling me you don't like Amanda's the bill she she sponsored and is floating. To, uh, to have a mandated, but at the same time, you know, in her defense, when I look at it, we do have, we do have some, uh, I can agree with Amanda that there's a problem <clears throat> if a child gets to the fourth and the fifth grade and they're still not reading. So if, if she's on the wrong path, what's the right path on that decision? Well, I think that teacher involvement, parent involvement is the right path. Okay. If the parents and the teachers aren't working together for a common goal, then the child isn't driven in the right direction. Okay, so so just just to, you're telling me that the, that parent teacher conferences, as an example, you've got those with your with your kids. If there's a reading impediment, first off, the 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 the, the parent should hopefully have an ongoing conversation with the teacher in it at any rate, and it certainly should come up in those those kind of parent teacher meetings. Is, 
and so hopefully they're going to sit down and come up with a formula to say, John or Sally has got an issue here, and these these are the things that need to take place. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah. Take a proactive approach in it. This okay. is where the parent and, and the teacher are the front line. Pe- they're the front line people. They know what's going on with that individual child. They're how many the kids, ones who can how help. How many kids do you have? Three. How old are they? Uh, Landon's nine. Noel is seven, and Paxson is three. Okay. How how are the two older ones reading uh, capacity? Landon's really really good at reading. Um, Sometimes he just gets lazy, but he's really good at it. Uh, my first grader, who's Noel, um, we switched schools this year, and she's gotten better. But she's not the best reader. But she's not, she's smart in every other aspect of the classes. And part of that, we sit down with her teacher. In fact, the first conference, she sat down with me and said, hey, Noel's a little behind. And I said, not a problem. What do we got to do? And we have put out a game plan and started reading with her, getting her to read books that were a little more difficult because the challenge pushed her. Noel likes to slack a little bit, which is really funny, but we pushed her a little bit harder with a little bit more difficult, so it made it easier to come back to the easy side. Folks, we're going to go to a break, and we will be right back. Be a survivor, not a statistic. Renegade River in Spring Lake has new and used handguns, hunting guns, sporting goods, and survival gear. Protect your rights and your freedom. Ask about their CPL classes. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. You put in 10 hours at the office. When you get home, there's a leak to be fixed, a softball team to coach, and a science project that needs help. Once you finish being Superman, you click the iHeartRadio app on your smartphone and listen to the station you created just for days like this. You've earned it. 1,500 radio stations, 18 million songs to create your own. Text IHR to 45495 to download the app or listen at iHeartRadio.com. Homeowners, now is a perfect time for you to have Lasco service your plumbing, heating, drain, and water treatment systems. Remember, you can even call us after work or on the weekends when you're available and we'll be there for you. At Lasco, we answer our phones, show up at your convenience, and give you a guaranteed price and rating before we start any work. Lasco specializes in keeping your family safe, comfortable, clean, and guarantees your satisfaction. Lasco Plumbing and Mechanical. Take a look at your television set. Notice any knobs to change the channels or the volume? Didn't think so. The remote control sure makes our lives so much easier. Well, what about backing up your computer files at work and at home? Are you still doing that manually? I use Carbonite Online Backup because I need to know that my files are being backed up to the cloud with the latest technology. Please, don't risk losing your files. Get Carbonite today and make sure your files are backed up to the cloud too automatically and continually. And if you run a small business or if you work at one, Carbonite will back up all your computers, servers, and external drives. For affordable cloud backup at work and at home, the only thing you need to remember is Carbonite. Start a free trial at Carbonite.com today. No credit card required. It really is a risk-free trial. And when you use promo code KIM, you get two free bonus months with purchase. Get Carbonite today and make sure your files are all backed up to the cloud. That's Carbonite.com. Promo code Kim. I will never forget the day my son Jeremy told me he hated me and slammed the door in my face. I'm behavioral therapist Janet Lehman. Behavior problems can turn the child you love and your life into a nightmare. That's why my husband James and I created the Total Transformation, the step-by-step program that shows you how to fix the worst behavior problems and get your child to respect and listen to you again. No matter what the behavior, defiance, backtalk, angry outbursts, disrespect, we can help you stop it. Now you can get the total transformation for free. All you need to do is get the program and let us know how it works for you. You can keep it forever for free. Limited number of free programs available. Call now. 1-800-494-0326. 1-800-494-0326. That's 1-800-494-0326. 1-800-494-0326. 
Renegade River in Spring Lake wants to buy your used handguns and hunting guns. Renegade River, your hunting, camping, and survival store. Stop in and check out their new and used firearms, sporting goods, Army and Navy supplies, and survival gear. Downtown Spring Lake, next to the police station. Uh, welcome back to the Renegade River Show. My name is Mike Hewitt, and we are in today with Matt Wiedenhoff, who has announced his candidacy for the State House of Representatives in the 89th District. That makes him a primary challenger. And um, uh, we've got a lot of topics on the table. I want to pick up on education a little bit longer than we'll segue into health care and a handful of other questions i got to throw at you. But you, one of the things that... that you had me thinking on when we left off was you talking about kind of talking about brain development. It's up to the parent and the child to determine whether whether it's a learning impediment, if it's if it's a developmental issue, uh, if if simply reading at home with the parents is is a, a viable thing. Now, do you in your family? Do, let's take the three year old who's working herself. It is a girl, right? Uh, Paxton, boy, boy, Paxton, who's working himself towards uh, towards a path that we're on. Uh, you and your wife reading to him, How's, what, what kind of foundation are you building for him? Yeah, we read with him. Uh, he actually sits with us as we read with our daughter, too. Uh, every night when we're reading with her, he's sitting there reading with us. Okay. Uh, we have her read books to him, too, with us while we're sitting there reading them. So we kind of make it a family thing at night where we all sit on the couch and let her read, then we read it, and then... She reads to him, so it also benefits everybody all around, and we have a good time doing it. One of one of the things I've my daughters, all four of them are grown and married, and have I've got grandbabies. Like I mentioned, I went to Kangaroo. I'm still tired from that, but <laughs> uh, when I when I listen to those things, and I and then I reflect on my own childhood, um, I'll give you an example for my own self. Um, I, I mentioned my daughters because they all developed a different different times in different ways. So for me, uh, linguistics, I've always been pretty good at that. I could pick up English. I could, although sometimes on the radio, I'm, I wrestle with it, it seems like, and draw blanks for words. But but I'm fairly good with, with it and always have been. It was one, one of my my stronger areas. My weaker area has always been math. So I listen to you talk about accounting and all of those things that I'm mildly jealous. But I remember in school, a little bit older than third grade, but when they're typically or normally teaching algebra, as an example, man, I couldn't get my head around that to save my life. Now, but I was fairly strong in all of the other areas. And then there came a point later on, uh, of course, too late, by the way, but later on when I went, why was that such a tough thing? It's obvious. And, it, and I think it's part of where it, it's got to be brain development. Um, I, I think that I don't know if it would have been good to alter my life path by holding me back a grade or so, or advancing me, by the way, for an individual topic. And so in this, I think you and I agree, but but it's a slippery slope because I will tell you that Amanda's heart is in the right place. She's I, I know her well enough that I can say that. You know, we don't have to always agree, but her heart's in the right place. So um, on education, you know, we talk... One of the biggest topics this this past year has been Common Core, um, and I don't think my my opposition to Common Core is a secret. I've talked about it on the air significantly. By the way, I've had a number of candidates for different house races on the show um, over the last several months, and asked each one of them the same question. So you're stuck with it, also. If you would have already been in office, how would you have voted on Common Core, and why? I would have absolutely voted no on Common Core. This. This is not a positive step in the right direction to make it a positive impact on our education. It's far more to do with selling books rather than preparing the students for a self-reliant future. I got to tell you, let me let me stop you. The the self-reliant future thing is is pretty paramount for at least me. And I don't I don't know where common care call comes down on that, but I will tell you that. When I look at myself as a father, when my daughters were growing up, th the primary responsibility I felt that I was charged with was to make sure that they could grow up and be a, and be as self-reliant uh, as they chose to be. Uh, and I mean that most literally. If they want to have a uh, get married and have kids, if they wanted to be entirely reliant on her husband or not reliant at all, I wanted them to have the backbone and the capacity to make that as a conscious decision, 
not a necessity decision. And so when I when I think about education and I and, and you're talking about parents and teachers, I, I approach it with that state of mind because I genuinely think that's that's one of the primary charges of a parent. But but in the application that you put it in, how do you do you, how do you think Common Core detracts from self reliance? What are you telling me with that? Well, kids got to lo- have to learn in the way that's best for them. The parents and the teachers have to make that decision. We're going too much from what they call a management, a top-down system. The CEO is making all the decisions for the bottom level. They don't know the bottom level. We need to be going from a bottom-up approach, where our bottom level, which is our front line, the parents and the teachers who directly know what we call our customer, our children, what they need and how they need it. Okay. Um, and you're saying that if we give them this foundation education, that's parents working with kids and parents working with teachers, that that's going to end up equating to a self-reliant uh, a grown-up? Yeah, for yeah, words? yeah, definitely. Because what you're showing your, your, the children is, I make the decision to succeed. Nobody else is going to. They're not going to tell me how I have to do it. I make that choice so that that develops into other better choices. And with the guidance between the parent and the teacher, showing them that we care, you have the tools to do it, you can make these decisions on your own and make something good out of it. I don't. You don't need somebody interfering and telling you that you have to do it. It's better to make that choice rather than be told. When I look at Common Core, it... it, it it looks to me, and I've, I've had uh, Melanie Kurds on the show before, who's probably one of the leading activists uh, in, uh, uh, people that, in terms of knowledge, at least in the state of Michigan. She's probably one of the most knowledgeable people that took an active role in trying to defeat Common Core. Um, to, to me, it's a little bit like Amanda's third grade thing in, in as much as it, it, it makes blanket policies. And and I happen to agree with you, by the way. I think the agenda is to sell books, not educate kids. And so that makes it a corporate agenda. But then I look and say, okay, what's the government got to do with it? And it always seems to be follow the money. Uh, be, because just like No Child Left Behind was a train wreck, this appears to be chasing after federal funds and chasing after book sales and chasing after a lot of things that I don't think have a whole bunch to do with with, with teaching kids. Am I off the path with that kind of thinking? No, no. I, I believe that you follow the money and you're seeing the trail. You're you're picking it up. And oftentimes when we see there's a bad, in our opinion, type of influential uh, decision like this, you can follow that trail and find out where it leads. And it doesn't often lead to the people in our district. We're supposed to represent our district. And the people in the district are the frontline people, the parents and the teachers. They need to work together to make that decision not be told how to make that decision. Well, let's take the 89th district. Um, in, in fact, from a conversation I had with Amanda, she, I had I had said that the 89th district was the most conservative district in Michigan, and she, uh, and I'm not sure where I got my math, to be frank with you. That's what it feels like to me, and I know a little bit about the 89th district. We'll talk about my experience there in a little bit, but um, and she indicated it was the third most conservative district. And so when you're talking about representing the people, it's your job to represent the people. Um, are, are you are you making a connection between her voting record and the 89th district? Or what do you, what do you say on with that? Yes, definitely. Um, there's been some votes that I don't believe represent our district. And our district deserves to be represented. That's why it's called the House of Representatives. Our, what we do is in the title of the position. We're not there for ourselves. We're not there to push an agenda. We're not there to, to help anybody else besides the people of the 89th and to make the state a better as a whole. If it's not in my view, but the district wants it, that's what you do. That's why you're elected to go there and represent the people at home, not represent yourself or anybody else that's driving you for their own agenda. Listen, one of the things I've wrestled with and I've asked a few candidates on this show in the past, um, and myself as a candidate gone by, by the way, um, there seems to be there's an age-old debate between two states of mind. The one state of mind says, do I vote my conscience? 
is if I'm your state representative and I go to Lansing, and I, by the way, I think Amanda's done this. I think she, I don't agree with her. I like her and I respect her. But I think what she's done is she's went to Lansing and voted her conscience. The other, the other mental paradigm, the other path is to vote the, the, uh, the, do the best you can to represent the majority of the people in your district. And that may not always be exactly what you're in agreement with. So if you're the state representative, if you should win, do you vote your own conscience or do you vote what, what, what the, the majority of the people in the 89th district um, are after? Which one do you say? You vote with the majority of district. That's where I'm representing. I'm not representing my own conscience. Okay. And the so people you're saying, elected you're, me. You're trying to tell me there's more than one person in the 89th district. Unfortunately, yes. Otherwise, I would win already. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't need to bother with all the work, huh? <laughs> that's that's terribly funny. But um, so you would have voted no on Common Core. Is that what I got out of that? Definitely, without even second thinking it. Okay. When when you look at the vote, I, mean, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but Common Core won with most or all of the Democrats um, in our state legislature, and about a third. Roughly about a third, same as Medicaid expansion, by the way, which we're going to get to in the last segment. Um, but about a third of the Republican Party sided with the Democrats on that issue. But you, you are, as an instructor, you must come in contact with some teachers, other teachers, other than you and your own ideology. What, what, what's the feel or sense that you're getting from from the teachers you talk with on Common Core? Where are they at, rather than where you and uh, Amanda are at? Well, some of the other college instructors do get a little worried on where's the development going to happen and uh, is it going to translate into them down the road when they get to their classroom. But I've also talked with high school teachers and middle school. They are 100% against it. I have not met a single teacher at the secondary level say, I like Common Core. In fact, most of them tell me it's difficult to teach and they can't get it through to the children. I'm I'm told that that um, aside from the fact that state by state has made a decision, and that the majority of the states are on board with Common Core, although a couple of the states have already retreated from it. But I'm told that even even within the state of Michigan, Common Core has been accepted to various varying degrees depending on the district. Um, and and frankly, I've not been engaged with the Grand Haven High School or that or the Ottawa County S- School District in general to determine. Where we're, at what level they've embraced it, um, but are you saying that if you were let's let's make you a superintendent of a school district for a minute, if there were any choice for you to retreat from it, even though it's a state, it's something our state legislature legislation has passed. That's it's something you would try to retreat from as a uh, as a uh, a superintendent of a school district. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> if if it's an absolute law and you have to implement it, you're going to do it at the absolute bare minimum, bare bones. I can tell you this, the school my kids are at right now said so they were going to implement it. Right. They retracted from it immediately. There was such an uproar from the parents, and once they saw the curriculum, they said no, and they had to backtrack. They flip-flopped on it yeah. for the better. So as soon as I got to the global citizen part, I, I found myself in retreat on Common Core. I'm not much for the ideology that's attached to global citizenship. Um, but that's that's just me as a guy that believes in state rights. So I'm hardly even a nationalist, much less a globalist. Um, <laughs> that never was. But so you're telling me that as little as possible and none at all, if if you could, when you get to Lansing, if you win, are you going to sponsor a bill that says let's let's get rid of Common Core? Yeah, I would. I'd be more than willing to do that. Um, my feeling is let's quit following and lagging in Michigan. Let's be the leader. Why can't Michigan lead in education? Why do we have to just be another state that adopted Common Core? Let's get rid of it. Let's fix our educational system in a more positive way that involves the teacher and parents relationship and the community involvement. And let's be a leader. Let other states follow us into the next generation of education. You know, Matt, let's shift topics a little bit if we can. Uh, Over the next few months, there's going to be a battle. There already is a battle. And it's going to be heating up as the summer comes on over the concept of part-time uh, part-time legislation, um, and I, I can't remember the exacts of it, but it's going to reduce reduce pay for a state legislator from roughly eighty grand down to roughly thirty five thousand. Uh, it'll reduce staffing. It's going to reduce a lot if it should pass. 
Um, where are you at? If you were, if you had a vote as a state legislator, if you'd have won already, and if you were Amanda Price and you're sitting there and you get to cast a vote for or against, where are you at on part-time legislation? Well, here, here's the thing. Being a father, a husband, an ex-hockey player, an ex-hockey coach, a educator, I don't do anything part-time. If, if you tell me i got to work part-time, based on the amount of hours that I have to be there, quote-unquote, and cut my pay, doesn't matter. I'm there to put 100% effort, full-time ethic, work ethic into it all the time. The state reps average more than 600 bills a year. That's crazy. I can't. I just am shocked by that. I mean, removing obstacles to success is what the job's all about. It's not building barriers. It's removing them. And with 600 bills, I only see barriers being built. And with a part-time legislator, I do believe that we can start removing them rather than building them. We won't have that much time there without our people around us. We need to be be in our district. I, I'm I'm personally a supporter of part time uh, of a part time legislature. I don't. I got to tell you though, candidly, I don't like the way the current, um, the, the way the proposal is written. Okay, I'm not comfortable with that. Having said that, there's only four states that can legitimately say we have a full time legislature. Um, and so when I look to the other 46 and say economically, are they doing better than Michigan? And the answer is yes. If I look to them and say, are they doing better in terms of liberty? And the answer seems to be yes. Um, when I look at this, whatever the number is, six or 700 votes a year, um, I look out across Michigan myself and say, wow, is the answer really six or 700 new laws? And what kind of mind thinks that's the answer? Honest, I can't. For me, I can't get my head around that thinking. So you and I happen to agree on that, I think, hands down. Um, the, the notion that somebody thinks these are all good things, is it, to me, it's actually fearsome. But I, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in Lansing. I've run for state representative in the district you're a candidate in. Um, I mentioned earlier that I've got a little bit of experience there, and we'll probably touch on that in the last, in the last segment. But for me, when, when you go to Lansing, you're going to find that at least my interpretation was that the culture in Lansing measures the success of a legislator by how many bills they can sponsor and shepherd through the law. And I think, no kidding, that's about as far as, uh, from John Adams and, and Jefferson as you can possibly get. Um, they were meeting once a year. People say, oh, Mike, that's silly. We can't get by with a government that meets one, once a year. And I say, well, when I look at my own personal life, um, raising my daughters, um, I think, how much of that did I really need? And the answer is not so much. Um, that's my answer. So you and I are in agreement with that, but um, it, it can be a slippery slope. Um, tell me this, that taxes, where are you at? Increase, decrease? Well, I grew up listening and watching Ronald Reagan, my favorite president of all time, and he demonstrated that all ships truly do rise on a high tide. What this means is we have to build our economy and being in favor of lowering taxes is proven to be the truth and the effectiveness. You've got it. News Talk, News Talk 1090. 1090. Folks, WKBZ. we'll be right back. You're listening to News Talk 1090. WKBZ. Be a survivor, not a statistic. <laughs> Renegade River and Spring Lake has new and used handguns, hunting guns, sporting goods, and survival gear. Protect your rights and your freedom. Ask about their CPL classes. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Know your college basketball? Enter the News Talk 1090 Bracket Buster Contest and you could earn a cool million. That's right, a perfect bracket is worth $1 million, but you gotta register first. So go to Newstalk1090.com now and sign up your team. The top three finishers get $125 in merchandise from the Golden Diamond Center at Gold Recyclers, plus $75 gift cards from Bellocinos and Cricket's Pub, courtesy of Greenscape Lawn. Registration deadline is March 20th at noon. So enter now and good luck from News Talk. 1090 WKBZ. When you're deciding where to entrust eye care for yourself and those you love, enlist the aid of Shoreline Vision. That's where our area's civic and business leaders place their trust. 
This is Kim Mulder from Serve Pro. My husband Randy and I made a great decision switching over to Shoreline Vision. For years, my contact lenses were giving me dry eyes. Dr. Namitz and Spring Lake put me in different contacts that honestly have taken away my problem with dry eyes. This is an awesome thing. The staff at Shoreline Vision is so helpful and nice. Anytime we have a question or concern, they are always right there to help us out. Our only regret is not switching to Shoreline Vision sooner. Area leaders trust Shoreline Vision with locations in Muskegon, Spring Lake, North Muskegon, and Norton Shores. Call 231-739-9009 to discover more about how Shoreline Vision can help provide vision care for life. 231-739-9009. We're challenging the private sector to hire or train 100,000 unemployed veterans, and that begins with connecting our veterans with employers looking to hire. And we're not going to stop until we find a way to serve and support every single military family in America. Go to iHeartRadio.com slash share your stripes to learn more and share your story. Hire smart, hire vets. Powered by Military.com and Monster.com. The IRS issued an identity theft alert to millions of Americans who pay taxes, including many of my listeners. LifeLock reminds us, identity thieves know that virtually all the info they need to steal your identity and even your life savings is right there on your tax forms. Case in point, the Treasury Department announced that an ex-IRS employee used taxpayers' personal information to file multiple fraudulent returns stealing more than $300,000 from taxpayers like you and me. Last year alone, identity thieves stole over $3 billion with fraudulent returns. This is too big to fight alone. No one, not even law enforcement, can stop all identity theft. If you're filing taxes this year, especially if you're filing online, do what I did and arm yourself with LifeLock Ultimate Protection. Visit LifeLock.com slash Kim now or call and mention promo code Kim to save 10% on your LifeLock Ultimate membership. Call 1-800-417-3841. 1-800-417-3841. 1-800-417-3841. Network does not cover all transactions. Renegade River and Spring Lake wants to buy your used handguns and hunting guns. Renegade River, your hunting, camping, and survival store. Stop in and check out their new and used firearms, sporting goods, Army and Navy supplies, and survival gear. Downtown Spring Lake, next to the police station. Fox News Radio, I'm Jane Metzler. The U.S. helping in the search for a Malaysian Airlines jet that disappeared Saturday. Three Americans among hundreds on board. Tensions did get a little heated. Reporters pressed authorities as to why nothing has been found. Our main focus here is to find the missing aircraft. And if we cannot find the missing aircraft, that's, that's very difficult for us to determine what actually happened. Malaysian authorities are now saying as many as four passengers on that flight are being investigated as they may have boarded with false documents. Fox's Elizabeth Pran, Ukraine's prime minister, coming to the U.S. for talks this week. Russian President Vladimir Putin on the phone today with the leaders of Germany and Great Britain, insisting next Sunday's referendum in Crimea is legal. Daylight saving time started overnight. Set your clocks ahead an hour, if you haven't already. Fox News. We report, you decide. This report is brought to you by Gun Lake Casino. When your share of up to $300,000 in Gun Lake Casino's Pyramid of Cash giveaway. Drawings every Thursday and Sunday in March. 90 cash winners guaranteed. Only at Gun Lake Casino, the jackpot capital of Michigan. Here is the official News Talk 1090 WKBZ forecast. For today, a mix of clouds and sunshine with gusty winds out of the southwest increasing to 20 to 30 miles an hour with a high of 34. Overcast skies still windy tonight and a low of 30. 32. Southwest winds 20 to 30. Tomorrow, mostly cloudy with a high of 41. Southwest winds 10 to 20. And mostly cloudy skies for Tuesday as well with a high of 39. Wednesday, cloudy but colder. A high of only 22. News Talk 1090 WKBZ, the talk of Muskegon. Uh, welcome back to the Renegade River Show. My name is Mike Hewitt, and we are in today with Matt Wiedenhoft, who has announced his candidacy for the 89th District State House here on the show today. Matt, when we left off, I keep talking beyond my break mark, but when we left <laughs> off, uh, we were talking about taxes. I, I just, before we move on into a couple other topics, I wanna make sure I understand, are you for higher or lower taxes or what were you telling me? What's the bottom line? Lowering taxes, bottom line. Get rid of regulations and get rid of excess spending. Okay. Uh, whether it's the state or the federal level, every time 
one of the governments gets a penny, they want to spend it. Yep. If not two. Two pennies. Maybe two. Yeah. And we don't need that. We no. need a transparent tax system okay. that everybody knows where every one of those pennies is going. Where are, where's our benefit? What are we doing? We're paying for this, but why? What's, what would be a... What would be a transparent tax system? What do you What do you have in mind, Matt? That's a That's a big term. Yeah, yeah. You hear transparency a lot, uh, <laughs> <laughs> especially from President Obama. He loves that word. Yeah, I've he's never... not not so much for its meaning, but he loves the word. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, what I mean is a flat tax, a fair tax. It doesn't really matter as long as it's out there for people to actually see and understand. So you're saying you would be either a flat taxer or a fair taxer. Is that what you're telling me? Either one's better than what we have. Yeah, I think that's exactly probably true. Um, hey, let's let's segue in our little bit of time because there's a there's a, a monster topic we haven't touched on directly, and that's Medicaid explosion. I'm sorry, Medicaid expansion. <laughs> I can't get myself away from saying that, no matter how much Governor O. Snyder's office asks me to. <laughs> so, but that's just me, not you. Where are you at on government explosion? If you'd have been there, <laughs> if you'd have been there during the summertime and and uh, People were prom promising campaign contributions and political favors. Would that have moved you? Where would you have been on this vote? The only people that are going to move me are the 89th District. Okay. Uh, and where that, do you, by the way, on that topic, where do you think the 89th District is on Medicaid explosion? I believe the 89th District is on personal responsibility, which would be against Medicaid explosion. Okay. What, Expansion. <laughs> it's catchy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me this. What is, how, what's your flavor of personal responsibility? I, I've, I've noticed you've written that a couple in a couple different places. So what do you what do you get at with personal responsibility for health care? Well, what I mean by personal responsibility is everybody should have the choice uh, of best pricing, best services, not being told where when they can get it, how they have to get it, what they have to pay, what they have to do. Um, where's the, there's no personal responsibility in that. You're just being told. Yeah. Let me let me echo my own words for a few moments here for just a second even. When, when I look at the two areas that government has promised to help us with the most, it's health care and education. And, and anyone that's listened to this show has heard me rave on about this. But since 1980 forward, health care and education have went up in excess of 800%. Folks, that's insane. We can't afford any more government help. Okay, and then you use you've used the word mandate several times today. They're going to mandate what our health care is. They're going to mandate what our education is, and they're even going to mandate what our decisions are with our with our uh, our our sons and daughters. I got to tell you something. I like Amanda a lot, but I think those are fearsome directions. What say you? I agree. Uh, anytime I hear the word mandate, I don't get a positive feeling. Um, we need to stay out of the way. Government needs to stay out of the way. Give back the fiscal and personal responsibility to the people of our district, of our state, and the nation. That's where it needs to start. Personal and fiscal responsibility. Uh, let me let me interject something. The the left and their media will perpetually, always, daily, minutely, probably, if I could stand by watching the twenty four seven news hours, will say, "Okay, right wingers." You always say no, 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 no to everything. What are you going to do instead? Because one thing is for certain, they are right about one thing, the very, very left, is that health coverage is expensive. It is hard to get, okay? People like Oscar, who's out today, but Oscar will tell you, um, he, he, with his health issues, he had a heck of a time getting insurance. And you know what? I agree with him. That's a problem that I, I, I it's a problem that needs resolved. So to the left's point, Obviously, doing nothing isn't the answer. Do you have a suggestion? What should we do in place of the Medicaid explosion and uh, Obamacare in generally? Well, my mom has a similar issue uh, with diabetes and other health problems. To get insurance is next to impossible. Okay. And I do believe that is a problem. Yep. Nothing should say I can't get it. It's a free marketplace. If I had the money to buy it, I should be able to buy it. Right. Uh, should they be able to gouge me? No. We should have where we had the ability for competing markets. Are you trying to tell me you think that $9 for an individual Motrin tablet is gouging? Yeah, because I can go buy two for two eighty eight at Target, 40 of them. I suppose you think a $6 cotton ball is too much to ask for, too. Yeah, because at the dollar store, I can get 150 of them. Let me ask you this. I've said a number of times on this show that I think that the my own personal answer, and I don't, my, my answer uh, when I look at health care is 
to find a way that actually fosters or promotes or, or grows personal responsibility, to use your words. Um, it, it, the only way I know of to do that is, is to give people some skin in the game. Okay. When I look at, and we break it down real briefly, I look at Medicaid explosion. It started in 1965, and every single year since then, healthcare costs have went up, except for the four years that Newt Gingrich brought brought the Medicaid explosion backwards for four years. During that time, and only during that time since 1965, did healthcare costs they they plateaued for four years. And as soon as Medicaid was let back off the chain again, so were healthcare costs. These things are related. Um, and on that note, when I look at Obamacare and I look at Medicaid explosion, I think they're the same thing. Am I wrong? They're exactly the same thing. They're, they're tied. Can't have one without the other. One's funding the other. If we had done, if, if, the Michi- if Michigan had have voted in favor of an Obama-Michigan health care exchange, then we wouldn't have done the, the Michigan Medicaid explosion. That's my understanding of it. Um, but but the point I was that I was trying to make what if if we provided people let me use a, a savings account as an example so you want health insurance here's your savings account card it works like a visa and you shop for best services and, and best prices and if you go to Dr Oscar and he charges fifty dollars for an office visit and then Dr Brian charges seventy well we're going to go to Dr Oscar. Assuming that it's the same care and we're making a, a contribution. When I get to the end of the year, I should have created a savings account slush fund, okay, built the same way you would do an actuarial table on an insurance policy. We can have certain expectations there of how much an individual will spend. If an individual has saved money, then at the end, the end, the end of the year, give them some money back or reduce their premium for the next year. That's called fostering people fostering responsibility means give me a chance to have some skin in the game. Don't let me think my insurance company is paying for it and that they're the ones doing the cost analysis because frankly, folks, they don't care if you're willing to pay $9 for a Motrin tablet. As long as you'll pay that $9 plus a little profit for them, that's all they care about. And listen, I don't necessarily blame them for that. I hear people that I talk to in my shop all the time that say, well, that's my, that's my insurance responsibility. No, sir, your insurance's responsibility is to make money. It's your responsibility to take care of your health and the costs that go with it. Am I, am I talking out to lunch here? Am I nuts? Or what do you think? <clears throat> no, you're right. Uh, in the management classes, we talk about the number one responsibility of a corporation, which, just so we're clear, a corporation is a piece of paper. The number one responsibility is maximizing profits. If you're a publicly held trade company, your number one thing is maximizing profits. It's not about the customer. The extreme left, not necessarily moderate middle of either party, but the extreme left takes great delight in two taxing corporations. And and the more we can tax them or punish them for their successes, the happier they are. Is that a, you talked about growing jobs and so I got to ask, is that a healthy path for us to be on? No, no, no. You don't they there's a circular flow of money. It never goes past the government, though. So when they're in that circle, it's not a circle anymore. It now stops. So we lower those taxes. It then goes to the worker, who then goes to the store to spend more. Guess what? They have money to spend on hiring a new person who now goes to another store and spends money. It's a circular flow. When we don't do that and we start taxing it at the corporate high end, the people pay that difference. People do pay the difference. People pay all the tax. And, and in fact, I'll go you a step further than you're a candidate and I'm not running for office. Okay, <laughs> Corporations don't pay tax, folks. I'm just telling you. They don't pay tax. They don't pay fees. Okay, Whoever buys their products and or services, that's who's paying their government freight. So the idea of punishing Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola or General Motors, et cetera, et cetera, is nonsense. It's ideological hype designed to cause class warfare, to secure votes. It has nothing to do with math whatsoever, okay? That, that's how I see it. Now, in, in my mind's eye, if I were a business, poor, a business owner sitting on the border of Ohio and Michigan or Indiana and Michigan or Wisconsin and Michigan, because so many people seem to f- forget that we have a UP and another border. <laughs> if I were a business owner sitting on one of those borders and was trying to decide where to open my business, I'd be looking at corporate tax because it goes to the cost of my goods and services. Not, oh golly, I've got to pay more tax, but can I make my products marketable by having a constrained uh, price? 
because this is price sensitive. It normally is. I understand it doesn't work that way in the healthcare industry because otherwise we would have nine dollar Motrin tablets. Yeah. But you know that's because everybody thinks everyone thinks that having an insurance is great because it's free, especially if they've got an employer or government sponsored one. But the irony of that is, is that if you're an employer. Um, or if you're an employee, rather, and you think you're getting free insurance, you're not. That's your wages. If they didn't have to pay for your insurance, then you'd have a higher wage. All of these things are related, and to pretend they aren't is silly to me. But what do you think What do you think are some key things we need to do to grow economy? Let me put you on the spot for a minute. Well, obviously, taxes are the number one. Okay. Uh, you see companies moving all the time. Yep. And they're, they're moving to states where... There may be a better tax situation for the at the corporate level, yeah. and even the individual level. Uh, that's always the first thing that I see as the motivation between these companies moving. The second is the people. We have the people here. We have the intelligence. We have the work ethic. We need to showcase that. That's how you grow the the economy in our area. Uh, tourism in our district huge. We sit right on Lake Michigan. We need to do more there. Um, but what, just real quick on the thing you were talking about, healthcare insurance yeah. has become so inelastic, what we say in the economics. And inelastic means no matter what the price you have to pay for it, it's become, it's, it's such an inelastic thing that we continue to make it worse so there can be more government intervention with things like the Medicaid expansion. Why? We shouldn't have that. Get them out. We now make that elastic like you were explaining with that savings account. Let me. We've only got a couple of few minutes left, so let me let me cut to the chase. There's going to be a lots of folks that say, "Okay, great, but he can't win." Can you win? Everything I do is to win. Okay. I don't step into anything to lose. Do you have a game plan? How are you going to win? Oh, work hard all day long, all night long. All I do is work. I work for my family, work for my business, and I will work for the people in our district and the state. All of everything I'm doing is about making a better future. For my families, my neighbors, my friends, my enemies, it doesn't matter who it is. If you live in my district or the state, I'm working for you harder than I work for myself. I don't ever fight for myself. And I play hockey, so I can get into them. But I will fight for anybody else on my team that I feel is being uh, treated with injustice. And right now, that's where I'm at. I've dropped the mitts. Let's make it happen. Some folks are going to think you're an outsider uh, challenging a primary, a Republican primary incumbent. Are you an outsider? Yeah. Okay. What does that, how does, how does, what's that mean? Uh, in, in, in my opinion, it means nothing. It means that uh, in terms of support, I am here, like I said, to fight for everybody. I want to help remove obstacles. That's what I want to go to Lansing and do. If a person wants to contact your campaign or find more about you, well, first let me say that by tomorrow this will be on YouTube. So if a folks wants to hear what you said again or if they haven't heard, if they want to share it, they'll be able to do that. But but aside from YouTube, if a person wants to find out more about you, your candidacy, what do they do? A couple different ways. Uh, as of tonight, the website will be up and running, and that is www.mattweedenhoft, W-I-E-D-E-N, H O E F is in Frank T is in Thomas dot com and on Facebook at Facebook.com backslash Matt Weedenoft. And they can email me personally if they'd like to with any questions. I'm I'm gonna be available. That's my key. Uh, at Matt at Matt com. I want people to let me know what they need. Got a Facebook uh, uh for for your campaign or no? Yes, that is the Facebook page uh at Matt dot com. Okay. All right, very, very nice. Uh, any final points you want to make before before uh, the sands run through the hour ga- glass? We need to make a better district for ourselves, for our families, and get back to personal and fiscal responsibility. We're getting away from it. We need to bring it back. This is what we want. This is what the district has clearly stated they wanted. Let's make it happen. Sounds like individual ruggedness and American spirit to me. Folks, we will see you next week. Thanks for listening this week. Um, find us on iHeart tonight at midnight for a replay. YouTube always. Um, Thanks very much. We'll talk to you in a week.